Chapter Sixteen of Mary, a Fiction by Mary Wollstonecraft. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by April Gonzalez. Chapter Sixteen. Soon after the ladies left her, she received a message from Henry, requesting, as she saw company, to be permitted to visit her. She consented, and he entered immediately with an assured pace. She ran eagerly up to him saw the tear trembling in his eye, and his countenance softened by the tenderest compassion. The hand which pressed her seemed that of a fellow creature. She burst into tears, and, unable to restrain them, she had her face with both her hands. These tears relieved her. She had before had a difficulty in breathing, and she sat down by him more composed than she had appeared since Anne's death. But her conversation was incoherent. She called herself a poor disconsolate creature. Mine is a selfish grief, she exclaimed. Yet, heaven is my witness, I do not wish her back now she has reached those peaceful mansions where the weary rest. Her pure spirit is happy, but what a wretch am I. Henry forgot his cautious reserve. Would you allow me to call you friend? said he in a hesitating voice. I feel, dear girl, the tender interest in whatever concerns thee. His eyes spoke to us. They were both silent a few moments. Then Henry resumed the conversation. I have also been acquainted with grief. I mourn the loss of a woman who was not worthy of my regard. Let me give thee some account of the man who now solicits thy friendship, and who, from motives of the purest benevolence, wishes to give comfort to thy wounded heart. I have myself, said he, mournfully shaking hands with happiness and i'm dead to the world i wait patiently for my dissolution but for thee mary there may be many bright days in store impossible replied she in a peevish tone as if he had insulted her by the supposition her feelings were so much in unison with this that she was in love with misery he smiled at impatience and went on my father died before i knew him and my mother was so attached to my eldest brother that she took very little pains to fit me for the profession to which I was destined. And, be I tell thee, I left my family, and in many different stations ramble about the world, saw mankind in every rank of life, and, in order to be independent, exerted those talents nature has given me. These exertions improve my understanding, and the miseries I were witness to gave a keener edge to my sensibility. The constitution is naturally weak, and perhaps two or three lingering disorders in my youth first gave me a habit of reflecting, and enabled me to obtain some dominion over my passions. At least, added he, stifling a sigh, over the violent ones, though I fear, refinement or reflection only renders the tender ones more tyrannic. I have told you already, I have been in love, and disappointed. The object is now no more. Let her fall asleep with her, yet this passion has pervaded my whole soul, and makes itself with all my affections and pursuits. I am not peacefully indifferent, yet it is only to my violin I tell the sorrows I now confide with thee. The object I loved forfeited my esteem, yet, true to the sentiment, my fancy has too frequently delighted to form a creature that I could love that could convey to my soul sensations which the gross part of mankind have not any conception of. He stopped, as Mary seemed lost in thought, but as she was still in a listening attitude, continued his little narrative. I kept up an irregular correspondence with my mother, my brother's extravagance and ingratitude has almost broken her heart, and made her feel something like a pang of remorse on account of her behaviour to me. I hastened to comfort her, and it was a comfort to her. My declining health prevented my taking orders, as I had intended. But I with warm vented into literary pursuits. Perhaps my heart, not having an object, made me embrace a substitute in more eagerness. But, do not imagine I have always been a die-away swine. No, I have frequented the cheerful haunts of men. And wit, enchanting wit, has made many moments fly free from care. I am too fond of the elegant arts, and women lovely woman that has charmed me that perhaps it will not be easy to find one to whom my reason will allow me to be constant i have now only to tell you 
that my mother insisted on my spending this winter in a warmer climate, and I fixed in Lisbon, as I had before visited the continent. He then looked Mary from the face, and, with the most insinuating accents, asked if he might hope for her friendship, if she would rely on him as if he was her father, and the tenderest father could not more anxiously interest himself in the fate of a darling child than he did in hers. Such a crowd of thoughts all at once rushed into Mary's mind, that she in vain attempted to express the sentiments which were most predominant. Her heart longed to receive a new guest. There was a void in it. Accustomed to have someone to love, she was alone and comfortless, if not impressed with particular affection. Henry saw her distress, and not to increase it, left her room. He had exerted himself to turn her thoughts into a new channel, and had succeeded. She thought of him, till she began to shine herself for defrauding the dead, and determining to grieve for Anne. She dwelt in Henry's misfortunes and ill health, and the interest he took in her fate was a balm to her sick mind. She did not reason on the subject, but she felt he was attached to her. Lost in this delirium, she never asked herself what kind of an affection she had for him, or what it tended to, nor did she know that love and friendship are very distinct. She thought with rapture that there was one person in the world who had an affection for her, and that person she admired had a friendship for. He had called her his dear girl. The words were fallen from him by accident, but did not fall to the ground. My child, his child, what an association of ideas. If I had had a father, such a father, she could not dwell in the thoughts, the wishes which obtruded themselves. Her mind was unhinged, and passion and perceived filled her whole soul. Lost in waking dreams, she considered and reconsidered Henry's account of himself, till she actually thought she would tell Anne. A better recollection then roused her out of her reverie, and aloud she begs forgiveness of her. By these kind of conflicts the day was lengthened, and when she went to bed, the night passed away in feverish slumbers. Though it did not refresh her, she was spared the labour of thinking, of restraining her imagination, its sported and controlled, but took its colour from a waking train of thoughts. One instant she was supporting her dying mother, then Anne was breathing her last, and Henry was comforting her. The unwelcome lights visited her languid eyes, yet, I must tell the truth, she thought she should see Henry, and this hope set her spirits in motion. But they were quickly depressed by her maid, who came to tell her that she had heard a vessel on board of which she could be accommodated, and that she was to be another female passenger on board, a vulgar one. But perhaps she would be more useful on that account. Mary did not want a companion. As she had given orders for her passage, to be engaged in the first vessel that sailed, she could not now retract. I must prepare for a lonely voyage, as the captain intended to take advantage of the first fair wind. She had too much strength of mind to waver in her determination, but it main wrung her very heart, opened all her old wounds, and made them bleed afresh. But what was she to do? Where go? Could she set a seal to her hasty vow, and tell a deliberate lie, promise to love one man, when the image of another was ever present to her? Her soul revolted. I might gain the applause of the world by such muck, heroism. But should I not forfeit my own, forfeit thine, my father? There is a solemnity in the shortest ejaculation, which, for a while, still such a mould of passion. Mary's mind had been thrown off its poise. Her devotion had been, perhaps, more fervent for some time past, but less regular. She forgot that happiness was not to be found on earth and built in a terrestrial paradise liable to be destroyed by the first serious thought. When, she reasoned, she became inexpressibly sad, to end her life bearable, she gave way to fancy. This was madness. In a few days she must again go to sea. The weather was very tempestuous. But of that, the tempest in her soul rendered every other trifling. It was not the contending elements, but herself she feared. End of chapter 16